Hello and welcome to the second of two videos where I'm talking about my research where I get people making things as part of the research process. This second video covers findings from the LEGO Identity Study. I'm David Gauntlet from the University of Westminster. I'm talking, as I said in the first video, about using visual methods where we get the brain working in a different way. In the LEGO research process, which is discussed in this book, Creative Explorations, we first of all get people used to using LEGO, then we get them thinking and building in metaphors, and then we eventually, after several exercises, get them to build metaphorical models of their identities in LEGO. All of that leads to the 11 findings which I'm going to present now. Very briefly romping through them all, first of all there's three findings about method. First of all, using creative and visual research methods gives people the chance to communicate different kinds of information. Language-based methods such as interviews and focus groups enable people to express certain things that are already in their minds, but a creative research process enables people to make something and then think about what they've made and reflect on it and talk about it. And going through that process leads to different kind of results. Because you take time, because you're making something with the hands and thinking with the hands, and because you get the chance to present something whole, you get a different set of responses. Secondly, using metaphors can be very powerful in social research. People get the opportunity to communicate intangible concepts. Lots of aspects of identity are quite abstract. Feelings of love and hate and happiness and shame and so on are all difficult to express in words, but making something visually using metaphors and then talking about it can be very enabling. You get the fruitful additional meanings, which are the very reason why we use metaphors in everyday communication, because you get the primary meaning and you also get additional spin-off meanings that enable people to communicate extra details. You've also got the relationship between the parts and the whole. You can talk about each individual metaphor that makes up an identity model, but also take a step back and look at the whole model as being a metaphor in itself. Thirdly, research participants need time to construct knowledge. People aren't necessarily prepared to talk about complex social issues or aspects of themselves. They need time to make something and reflect on it and then talk about it. This allows things to surface from the subconscious. Uh, it gives people the opportunity to put together things that they already know and gives them the opportunity to mediate abstract experience, to give it real form. Next, we've got four findings about social experience and identities. First of all, the concept of identity, which is familiar to sociologists and philosophers, turned out to be an everyday term that our participants recognised and were able to use. So the task of constructing a model of the identity made sense. Identity was something that people already thought about. And representing identity is itself a familiar task from the way that people put together representations of their identities, for example, on fridge doors. Fifth finding is that identity theories are common currency. The grand sounding sociological theories of sociologists such as Anthony Giddens or Irving Goffman turned out to be understood by people in a common sense way already. People were aware that they were constructing a narrative of the self, as Giddens argues, telling stories about themselves to other people, and used Goffman's theatrical metaphor with the front of stage and backstage when representing their identities. Finding number six was that identities were typically unified, not fragmented, as some postmodernists have suggested. Even when I grouped together particular kinds of identity under different generalised themes, there was only one theme, that of chaotic independent, which looked anything like this. But even in that case, they were single identities where the person was maybe struggling for some kind of meaning and thought that their lives were in a bit of a mess, but they saw their identity as one thing. You could build a fragmented identity in Lego with lots of different parts, or even just throwing lots of bricks down on the table and going, there you go, but nobody did that. Instead, there seemed to be a kind of will to coherence, a desire to have singular, solid, coherent stories about the self. Finding number seven is about the relationship between the individual and society. Here we identified, in almost all of the models, a tension between, on the one hand, the desire to be an individual, a distinctive individual, not the same as everybody else, whilst at the same time wanting to be part of the collective, the community, to be part of society, which everybody wants as well. It's as George Simmel said in 1893, on the one hand the individual belongs to a whole and is a part of it, while on the other hand they are independent and stand opposed to it. This was a tension which we could see in many of the models, as I said. 
Finally, we have three findings about media audience studies. Finding number eight, media studies is often too much about the media. We assume in media studies that the media is one of the chief determinants of identity. In this study, that didn't really seem to be the case. It's too easy to assume the centrality of the audience. In finding nine, we note that audiences are people and people are complex. This seems almost banal, but it's something that's frequently observed at the start of media audience studies, but then ignored. I say we need to keep hold of this complexity rather than just say it and ignore it. In finding 10, we note that when given the opportunity to say themselves what influences them, people generally don't list the media as being a key influence. That doesn't necessarily prove it's not an influence, but certainly I think we can reject this model of the media's role in everyday life. And then we're left wondering if there is a role for media in thinking about identity then. I think there is. And in finding 11, we see the media has a role in thinking about identity because... Media narratives present frames through which we can think about experience. Paul Ricoeur said that narratives are a vast laboratory for thought experiments. They suggest navigation points and stories, unifying themes which we can use to understand our experience of the world. So from this study, above all, perhaps the most interesting finding was that set of tensions that people deal with every day, and also the stories and metaphors that people used, which are circulated to a great extent by the media, to understand our lives. There's also the point about visual methods, the power of metaphors, and giving people time to communicate useful research information. You can read more about these studies at www.artlab.org.uk or in the book Creative Explorations. That's the end of this video. Thank you.